Welcome to Cross Border Interviews. We sit down with local elected leaders on this show from all corners of Canada. Now, over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with Rural Municipality of Lumpston, Saskatchewan's Deputy Reeve, Cody Jordison. But before we get into our interview, a brief moment to acknowledge the support that keeps our show thriving. Now, if you want to join our growing list of supporters, visit crossborderinterviews.ca and pledge your support for as little as $3 a month. That's crossborderinterviews.ca. Now, on to the episode. Cody, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with sort of a generic overarching question, but it's a question that I start all my interviews off. So, you know, exception to that is where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Cody? Hey, Chris. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, I listen to, you know, a lot of your shows and I think a lot of the answers a little bit more. Hang on. Sorry. My phone just went off. You're going to have to edit that. I didn't mute my, uh, I didn't mute my phone. I think we leave it in. I think we leave it. Leave it in. Leave it in. Every (laughs) counselor is going to get a kick out of that right now. Exactly. Go for it. Uh, So, yeah. So, uh, I grew up on a mixed farm south of Moose Jaw, kind of middle of nowhere in the hills. If uh, it's not the typical Saskatchewan setting that most people grew up with, but um, my dad was on council uh, for a long time. But so you might think that maybe I had that, you know, that goal of doing what he did. And it wasn't like that at all. It was more of a more of a blue collar ideology, um, more of a sense of community needed to help. Um, you know, it, no different than if you see someone on the side of the road with a vehicle broken down in the wintertime, you're going to pull over and stop. Uh, it wasn't, you know, being here wasn't anything that I strive to get to. It just kind of happened. And uh, how that happened. So I, I was new to the area. I only moved here about 10 years ago, and uh, which is about how long I've been on council. And the current uh, counselor at the time uh was, he was on his third term, I believe. Um, elections happened. He got in. He didn't want to run, but nobody nobody ran. And he heard that I'd moved to the area, like within just after the election. He said, well, somebody else is here. I don't want to do a fourth term. I don't got one in me. So he shortly after the election resigned. And uh, I was actually busy. I was down in the States, and I was like, oh, no, I'm not interested. I don't even know. I don't know the people there. I don't know the roads. I'm just too new. And I said, maybe someday, you know, I appreciate because, you know, I did get a few texts on it. And I just said, you know, not timing's not right, not right now. And then uh, 10 days, two weeks later, I get a phone call. Uh, the window for the nominations were closing and no one had ran. No one had put their name in and there was no interest from anybody to run. So they were about two days away from closing and it was going to be a vacant chair. And I thought, well, that's, that's no, I know that's not good. You know, you do need to have a voice, even if it's maybe not the best voice or most educated, you know, I'll get educated kind of thing. So I reluctantly um, phoned up my neighbor's they signed my nomination form and threw it in there and no one ran and got in and here we are on my third term and now a director with SARM. So, um, but a lot of that's come out of just sense of need for the community. Same with the, the SARM thing. Um, I do have a you know pretty big acreage as far as it goes here. We have, you know, 160 acres, but um, you know, there was a, in the RM, there was a bit of a split between the rural and the acreage people and uh part of the reason I ran for SARM was to really show the the farmers in the area, like, yeah, I'm here for you too. Um, I hear what you're for and uh, I can work for you guys too. So kind of balancing both sides of it. But yeah, that, that's how I, I ended up here. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a career ambition. It wasn't a goal or something I've worked towards. It was just kind of, I saw a need or there was a need and, you know, I was happy to help out. So there's a few things I want to unpack there, but I want to start with kind of the arching question that, I, I try to press a lot in this show, apathy. It sounds like there was apathy 10 years ago when you put your name forward and not just you, but even in the community of putting their name forward municipally. Now you've been in there for 10 years. You've seen people come and go probably not just in the RM, but in other communities that you surround. Why do you think there is an apathy in in, in municipal politics? That's a good question. I haven't quite figured it out yet. Um, Do you see it with your residents? Do you see people actually engage with you when you want opinions on issues that are in front of council? Oh, for sure. If if you engage, they'll engage with you for sure. When I was campaigning in the last election, uh, it took me a lot longer because I had I actually had to set a time limit at the houses because I, I would have been on the campaign trail for a month. Um, 
you know, I, I allowed it myself for what I thought was, you know, quite a bit of time, but um, I think there's a, there is a lack of engagement, uh, whereas you see provincially, federally, you know, there's radio shows, campaigning, you know, you're out there, municipalities tend to fly under the radar, um, which is ironic considering, you know, what, how much impact we have. It, and it's just, it's just different. I know now that I've, I've been around long enough, my name's out there. Um, I've been pretty aggressive over getting my name and literally my phone number out there. I remember when I campaigned on the back of my card, big bold letters, there was my phone number, give me a call, you know? And so, you know, people know they can give me a call and, but you're right. It's, I guess it just doesn't get the media attention. So it, it tends to fly under the radar. Maybe that's the answer. I'm not sure. Have you seen a big change in municipal government in your 10 years in office? Because I can imagine 10 years ago when you started out, you didn't think you'd be dealing with some of the issues that you're dealing with now, but you might have, or they might be the same issues. Has the role of municipal government during your time changed? Hmm. Uh, like As locally? Locally, yeah. Yeah, yeah, in your own community. Like, because yeah. when I speak to rural uh, municipal leaders, and I've talked to a few over the last few weeks, they're talking about there's a lot of things that have been changing because a lot more people are either coming to the rural communities or people are mm -hmm. leaving. And you're going to have to deal with the infrastructure issues as well that comes with population growth. Yeah, good to tee that up well. So, yeah, so I'll, I'll step away from the Arma Lumsden for a little bit and we'll go kind of the southern half of the province. Um, in the central specifically, there is definitely a bit of a, um, a population issue. So there's different councils that are having a hard time getting people back to locally um, in Lumsden. We actually have a lot of people moved in, in the last 10 years. We've had just a population explosion. I don't have the census numbers, but I want to say we've nearly doubled our population. Um, we're going to be over 2000 people here, I'm sure in the next census. So um, whereas 10, 20, 30 years ago is probably like 800 maybe maybe a thousand kind of things so we've had a, a you know a doubling in our uh our population which is great but you know i can see why we'll get into that a little bit later and you know the reasons why people want to come here but it creates a lot of challenges it sounds great but it, the problem is the people that tend to be moving into the rural area are the ones that are finding that kind of cheap piece of land that's off the highway maybe without a great road to it or it's you know, like in my case, I'm about half mile off the highway, but there's people that are two, three miles off and they're getting their house put there. And now they're the only property on that lane. They like being secluded, but now that grader has to go a long way to get to their place. And now, um, you know, a good example, uh, last winter, we had a pretty major snow event and somebody phoned me up frustrated, like, why aren't you guys focusing on the snow, the, the bus routes? And I said, 98% of our roads are bus routes. And they go, oh, okay. Um, but yeah, it's, so we've had a lot of people come in and, you know, the previous council, um, I'd say 10 years prior, kind of before I came, didn't have that big population growth and their, their mandate was more to just kind of keep the lights on. Um, there wasn't a lot of infrastructure being invested into. So when we came in, um, about 10 years ago, just by kind of fluke, people started moving out and then we had a real high water event. Uh, we had kind of nasty flooding for two years in a row. And every culvert in the area was destroyed. Our bridges were in really bad shape. So um, we kind of had turnover with council and then we had to go real heavy with our infrastructure investment. Um, heavy on the culverts, heavy on the bridges, heavy on the road, build on the road building. And uh, unfortunately with that comes an increase with tax dollars. So um, you have people moving in, taxes going up. Um, it's kind of seems like a bit of a negative, but I think uh, our council's done a good job and we've, plateaued that climb and i think we're starting to get things together here so so i want to go back to the role of counselor and thank you so much for answering that and the role of council and your role as the deputy reeve as well um you're faced with a lot of issues on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis whether it be just as a uh, rm issue or an individual issue from people how do you see yourself in the role of Deputy Reeve and particularly a counselor in balancing the needs of the RM with the needs of the individual person? Because I can imagine, like I can imagine with all municipal leaders, you get approached with a lot of different issues on a daily basis or a weekly basis. And you are sort of the government of proximity, the ones that are closest, so you're most approachable and you have to try and find solutions for them. How do you balance the needs of the community with the individual needs? That's tough. Um, 
a good question though. And that's, it's, it's one I think about quite a bit, actually, to be honest with you. Um, I have a lot of questions that haven't been resolved. I guess the, it's a little bit different um, when you come into the rural side of things versus urban um, people aren't looking for the needs per se. Like, you know, they don't have garbage. We don't have garbage pickup. Um, you don't see the utilities like your fire department, you're, you're going to pay for, but you're, you know, in, when you're in the city, you constantly hear, you know, with sirens, you hear the fire department, you hear the ambulance, you hear the police department here, you don't. Um, so they're there, you just might not realize it. Um, same, like your policing costs are, are pretty high out here. Um, you don't see them, you know, unless you need them kind of thing, but often you don't like people could go their whole lives without needing fire department. You know, that's the same in the city, but your odds of seeing them locally, like on your block, the odds of a fire on your block are a lot higher kind of thing than out here. Um, so it kind of, it's, it's what people are looking for is a little different for what their needs are. Their needs are keep my taxes low, keep my roads good. That's about the end of it. That's honestly kind of what people are looking for. They don't want, um, they don't want a lot of, a lot of government involvement. They want to, like when, when I campaigned, a lot of my promises to people were, um, hopefully you never hear from me out of sight, out of mind. You know, I don't, I don't want you to hear about me. I just want to do a good job for you. Keep your taxes low, which is pretty tough considering the world we're in right now, but I think we're doing a pretty good job of it. So. So that brings up a good yeah. question is how do you, how do you make decisions then? Because if, if you're telling people out of sight, out of mind, as long as I'm doing a good job, as long as you don't see me, we're doing good. But you have to make some tough choices as a counselor, as a, as a council as a whole, and particularly around the budget, especially these economic days where like things are challenging for a lot of people. The affordability mm. crisis is huge right now across Western Canada. Well, it, even in Canada as a whole. So you have to make decisions based on the best of the people. But you know, at the end of the day, the decisions you make are going to impact the people that you who vote for you or who are your neighbors. So how do you how do you make those tough decisions in a small community or an RM like Lumsden? Because you want to make sure you're doing what your residents want, but you don't want to sort of do it on a on the backs of them as well. Yeah. Um, so it's funny. I look in the camera and I realize I got my arm a Lumsden jacket on, and that's kind of the answer. It's it's cheesy, but it's true. Um, I have to take off my Division Six hat and put on my RM of Lumsden hat. And, you know, it, it's, you know, locally, the people that are going to vote for me, um, you know, you have to work hard for them too. But in the same breath, um, I'm here for the RM of Lumsden. You know, I'm here for everybody. So what's best for the RM? So that's where it's tough. You got to you gotta do the RM first. And then I guess at the end of the day, if, if they don't agree with what you're doing, they're going to vote you out. But so far, they seem to like it. But um, Does you got to do what's easier? best for the no, it gets harder because the more, the more you get to know people, the more it's, I mean, in some ways it's a little bit of a game, you know, you gotta, you gotta put the RM hat on and then you gotta double down on the side and work hard for some local projects. Like I always try and find something that's happening in my division so I can say, Hey, you know what, we're, we're working on this, this year, we've done this. I don't want to be able to look at anybody and say, yeah, we didn't do anything this year. You know, we did projects over here, over here, over here. I always try and make sure I pick a local project and make sure we, we focus on that. And so that I'm still getting good representation for my division at the arm council. But at the end of the day, when you make a decision, um, I have to take my division hat off and say, what's best for the RM. So, and there's a good example. We have a bridge that doesn't service very many people at all that got destroyed and we're going to have to replace it. And it's going to be a lot of money. And it's, you know, it's, um, the RM is going to have to spend a lot of money for a few people, but it's a really, it is something that's needed unfortunately that's just kind of how it goes we've made a little bit of a change in our budgeting um with where the where the tax money kind of goes so we have like an east west split so um we try and keep the east half tax money on the east half and the west and the west and we try and be responsible about it but at the end of the day it's the rm first so do you do you do you balance the personal life and the public life of a municipal councillor well oh yeah i don't I don't um, like when you go to the grocery yeah, store, easy, do actually. people stop you? Oh yeah. But no one, not about RM stuff. No, <laughs> no, no. I get, I mean, once people, you know, once in a while they will, um, but I don't hide that's for sure. And I don't, but I don't promote it either. Like the, the hat I'm wearing the jacket for the interview and I wear it to meetings, but I, don't, I won't wear it to the store. I just wear something else. You know what I mean? I'm just, 
uh, I, I don't wear it away from away from home or meetings kind of thing. So, no, and that's funny you say that. I had a I had a lunch this summer with a friend who is he's got some developments going on, and uh, we went for lunch. I sat on the patio on the street, and he was shocked. He's like, "Oh, you're going to sit where everyone can see you?" I'm like, "Well, you know, if if I can't live in this community, then I'm, I don't want to be on council." So, um, I got nothing to hide. You know, at the end of the day, not everyone's going to like every decision you make, but. I, I'm not going to hide. I live here first. And if I can't live here and do this, then um, I'm not moving. So one of them is going to have to go. So the, we're coming up to one year away from the next municipal elections in Saskatchewan. Yeah. Now I, I know there's some different there's in the RMs and correct me if I'm wrong here. Some elections happen in off years compared to others, if I'm not mistaken, but the majority of the municipalities will be heading to uh vote in October of next year. So one year away from now, what advice would you give someone who's potentially thinking about putting their name forward for municipal council in a rural municipality in Saskatchewan? Uh, two things, find someone that's on, on council already and talk to them and see what it's like being a council, your meeting schedule, those kind of things. And then talk to someone in the office at the end of the day, the office, you know, start those building those relationships there. Um, if you want to get anything done, that's where it's going to happen. I mean, great ideas are, are great and it's, it's nice and it's welcome. But at the end of the day, if you want to get them done, you know, it's, it's through your office, but, but talk to people. That seems to be the case with just about everybody that's come on to council since I've been in, um, you know, they come in and they want to change the meeting schedule. They don't understand Robert's rules. Uh, you know, there's a lot of those little, little things and they go, Oh, I didn't know. There's a lot of, I didn't know that. And it's, and I mean, there's always a, a learning curve for sure, but a lot of it was just didn't have a clue. They just came in with an agenda. And uh, a lot of them, you know, most of them, I would say, realize they get educated and they learn and they become great counselors, but there's a few that just doesn't work. So are you still learning on the job 10 years later? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> big time. Yeah. That's, I just, yeah, it's fun. Um, it's fun and it's humbling. Like people, people will phone me now and ask me questions. And I, I get real nervous when even doing this. Um, I get real nervous getting interviewed because yeah, I, I don't know, like I can't, I'll be honest with you. I almost want you to send the recording over to my administrative team so they can review everything and fact check it. And, you know, you know, I hope I get it right. So, um, you know, well intentions, I think go quite a ways, but uh, yeah, I, I, you're, you're constantly learning. There's so much you'll, you'll never have it. And that's, it's funny, like it's, um, I'm on my third term now. And I remember it was so cliche hearing politicians say, um, we got more work to do, we need another term. And I was like, yeah, no, I never really understood what that meant. And now, man, like I, I'm on my third term and I'm happy. I remember this last election feeling some pressure because I'm like, I need to get back in because we got work to do. You know, I got projects that are on the go and I want to see them through. And uh, yeah, it, but yeah, as far as learning and that, that comes with the learning too, you know, like, um, you know, one side, like on the, I've been on heavy on the public work side of things. And, uh, so I don't have, necessarily have a lot to do. Like I'm not on our finance committee. So it doesn't mean I don't know if it's going on finance, but those are very different conversations. And, uh, that's something, you no, know, the longer you go, you want to start to do more and more committees and transition a little bit. So, uh, that's something that I'd like to get a little better with. And now with the, with the storm director, um, now that's a whole new, whole new list of programs and that's a whole another thing that i'm learning too so it's it's a big workload still got to be you know keep everybody at home happy and then take on this other big role as well so yeah no cost that's but that's half the that's the fun part is is the learning so you know i've, going, le I've learned more about these more about municipalities in these interviews than i thought i would ever but i'm so happy that i have and it can imagine being someone who's on the other side of the table who's making the decisions it's a constant learning curve particularly about yeah. you provincial regulations federal regulations well, all that stuff. it's uh it's funny at work i'll be take i take my ipad to work every day in case that rare opportunity we get some downtime and uh people always laugh like they'll see me um you know reading or watching a video and i remember one day someone comes over they're like what are you doing i'm like oh i'm just reading legislation i'm like what and it's you know pages and pages of legislation legislation and regulations and bylaws and um yeah i enjoy that you know I do. I really do. And you got to be a bit of a nerd. I think um, you do. You got to get into that kind of stuff. So 
I, I agree, but I want to turn because I'm cautious of time. We're about 15 minutes in, and I want to turn to my second segment oh, oh. because this is this is the big segment. This is the one that I like talking about a lot. But not that it, I don't like the first one, but I like this one as well. And it's about the RM of Lumsden as a whole. And before I start this line of question, I'm going to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the Deputy Reeve and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is the Deputy Reeve's opinion. <laughs> I don't know why, but we get emails about this. I love people. it when you give that speech. I love it because I can just imagine the emails. I don't know why people think that my show is changing the way that their community is doing something, but here we are in 2023. Here we uh, go. So, Cody, in your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the RM today as of recording this episode? Uh, number one is is um, reducing taxes. Um, that's that's number one. Not just not stopping them from climbing, actually reducing. Um, right now, I think our taxes, I know our taxes are too high. Um, I mean, they're justifiable. I can tell you why they are the way they are. But what we need to do is um, to get them lower. And the way you do that is not through reduction of services, in my opinion, but through increasing our tax base. Um, so like I was saying earlier, I kind of teed it up by accident a little bit. We've had this massive population growth. And unfortunately, to make sure that um, things are being done right, we've had to at least double our staff uh, in the office. I would say double. I don't have the exact number in front of me, but when I say double, I'm pretty close. Um, so we've had a, you know, and that's a big expense. Your staff is always going to be your, your number one expense. I always say that but when you're paying 250 a liter for diesel, that's pretty expensive too. But um, yeah, you know, so our staff has had to go up and we kind of had this wild boom and now we've kind of pulled it all together and, and now we're, we're kind of, kind of coming out of it a little bit more organized. And now we're in a position where uh, part of that craziness was, uh, we had some commercial expansion as well. So we put some really good tax incentives in place and those are starting to take effect. And I think starting next year, um, those are going to start to pay off for us. We're also seeing some more of the high density residential come in. When I say high, like higher for us, like nothing high, like not like urban, but um, we're not competing with the town, but a little bit more of these uh, tighter subdivisions, they're going to start to come online. So a lot of the work we've done the last three to four years is going to start to pay off here. And we should, we should start to see a pretty significant increase in our tax base. And with that, we should hopefully, and combined with the previous uh, investments that we put into infrastructure, be in a position where I, I really do believe that we can actually reduce taxes. Um, it's it's be one of the, not many places can say they've actually reduced taxes. And we are, we are going to do everything we can to try and be one of the first. So, so, I understand that. I understand bringing in investment, bringing in uh, a more a stronger tax base. But in the short term, you have to realize, and I think you, you uh, your council would I would assume has realized that that is not going to happen tomorrow. And you're in a sort of affordability crisis where you've openly talked about bridges being under uh, repaired, uh, roads that probably need upgrades. Uh, this, that, and the other when it comes to infrastructure. So you can't just say we want to reduce taxes when big companies or more of a tax base comes to our community. You have to be in the here and now as well. So how do you balance that? Because I can imagine that's the tough part because you don't want to reduce services to fix a road, but you have to keep levels they the way they are. Inflation happens. The cost of doing work goes up. So how is your council and you as the deputy Reeve sort of balancing that aspect of trying to figure out the here and now with the 10 years from now? Yeah, no, good question. So we can, um, I can answer that because we've actually been putting the work in the last four to five years, well, even back probably six, seven years, really, where we've created a, a map showing where our, our real infrastructure deficits were and then tackling the highest priority ones. And then one of the things we've done is we basically do people care about that. Sorry. Sorry. Do people care no. about that though? Because if there's a road in front of my house and I believe it's the most important road issue that's in my community, I want the, the RM to fix it today, not 10 years from now when a, a budget or a, a document says it's going to be fixed. I want it fixed today. <laughs> so is, is there a sort of a, 
weird gray period where the RM sort of has to look at that, say, okay, 10 years, this road's going to be, uh, uh, need to be repaired, but right now we need to fix this one as well. Yeah, for sure. So we do have like a living document that does show all our priorities and you're, you're right. And that's part of like, when I say I have two hats, I have the deputy hat and I have my division hat on. Um, when I put my deputy hat on, we look at, you know, big pictures, like these are the priorities. And then one of the things we've done is rather than go out and borrow money, we start putting money into reserve, saving up, addressing things. And then there's a lot of grants that are available. And when you have money in reserves, when grants become available and you're ready to go on a project, and when you have an administrative team that's done their homework, we are ready to, we can, we can pull the trigger on a project really quick. And so we're able to do more, more projects for cheaper. And we've done those. So the last five to six years, we've been going hard on um, tackling the worst of the worst. And now we've knocked off those like that five, six years ago. If I was to look at that document and see what our priorities were, every one of those priorities are gone. We've done them. We've tackled them. Our bridges are in great shape. All of them. Everyone, except for the one, it's in the bottom of the river kind of thing. So, um, but all the rest of them are in good shape. Like they weren't even... Um, they're at the point where they weren't getting safe. Every one of our bridges, minus the one, will are in excellent. They get an excellent safety rating, and and we're good to go. Um, you know, there's some of them that are getting older, so we've put some money away every year. We're going to save up because the day will come. We're going to have to do something with it, but that's part of it. We have a really healthy reserve position, so if some of these projects do come up, we're in a good financial position where we can take it on without having to go to the taxpayers to pay for everything. So um, it makes our uh, our financial position a lot more stable. So to answer that, you're right. Like there is like right now, um, you know, we're in a position where because we've saved money, we can get some grants and we can offset um, some of those crazy costs. And we did get a little bit lucky. Like we budgeted for 250 a liter diesel and it came under uh, two years in a row. So that was lucky. Um, diesel costs were a lot lower than people projected. So a um, little bit of luck and generous forecasting on your finance department. But you're right. Like it's, it's, it's tough. Like the world's been in a, in a crazy position and we are like, so this, this last year um, we did actually to vote to not raise taxes for the first time. So we had a 0%, um, 0% on our tax, you know, taxes this year. So uh, we you know, we did it and uh, tough times, but good, uh, good. Call. And it was controversial. Not everybody agreed with it. Um, I'm still nervous about it. You know, I hope that, you know, you look at the city of Saskatoon, not to throw anybody under the bus, but you know they were really proud of the fact that they never raised, didn't raise taxes forever. Now they're looking at like eighteen percent. So um, yeah, you know we're, we're definitely I'm nervous, but we did it, and we have a mandate from everybody to get things under control. So we're going to um, give it a go. I'm going to ask the political question now, and I apologize to throw you under the bus, but I've been th- asking this question a little bit more often over the last few weeks because. I think municipal councillors are always wanting the best for their community and you don't have an unlimited supply of money. So you talk about grants. Grants come from two places, the federal government and the provincial government. But at the end of the day, they come from the taxpayer because that's who's actually paying them. So um, how do you, as your, as the deputy reeve, I want you to put on the RM's hat right now, not SARM's hat, but the RM's hat. How do you, how do you promote, the RM in a way that sort of makes sure that the RM gets those grants compared to other municipalities, because at the end of the day, you're all chasing after a pot of money from the provincial or federal government, and you need to put your best foot forward. So do you guys have a great staff? Do you guys have great uh, administration that's doing these grants or how are you as deputy Reeve going out there and selling the RM to the provincial and federal counterparts? Truthfully, it's not, it's, I can't take a lot of credit for it our staff get all the credit for it. Um, it's two things. It's having a good financial position. So when we see a project, it's identified ahead of time. So we've already had an engineer take a look at it. We have a rough cost estimate, really and cost estimates change by the month, <laughs> but you know, we have an, a ballpark idea what we're after and we've already put money away in a reserve for it. And we have a motion to continue every year to contribute towards that reserve. And then we, uh, you know, we, we already have a lot of other, um, you know, a road, for example, is kind of singular. It's tough to do that. But there is another road in my division, actually, that we're working on that's used by four other municipalities. So that's going to be you know, a bit of a cooperation thing. Anytime you can show a project is going to affect multiple municipalities and you're working together to show, to show some cooperation, that's kind of the key word, cooperation amongst you know, municipalities. Those projects always 
get favor when it comes to grants. That's for sure. So by having a, a staff that are really good at doing that paperwork and being organized, you get that reputation. Same, you know, but kind of behind the scenes. Um, when the powers that be, the guys that are going to actually hand these grants out, see our name. They know we have a good reputation because we do our homework. We do a good job with the paperwork and we're in a good position to get it done. It's not like we're going to apply for it and then go um, pending financial approval. We know we're ready to go. We have the money. We have, you know, we've done our background. We've done our homework. We're ready to go. Now, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, Cody, because I, I think you probably know a little bit better than I do. But um, while the mill rate in Saskatchewan is dedicated to provincial uh, municipal issues, you, you do still have a tax levy, a school board, a school levy as well. Right. Yep. So as much as you say you're going to try and keep it at zero percent, the province can come in and increase it as well. So while the municipal portion of the tax bill is going to be zero, yep. it may not always be zero. I just want to make sure I'm clarifying that one piece. Yeah, that's I, fair. Um, so I, I'm cautious of time. We're a half hour in. That took 15 minutes if you can believe it to just to talk yeah. about taxes. I, I, I find it so fascinating that I, I get so enthralled with taxes and wastewater and infrastructure projects oh. that time flies by. But here we are. Um you gotta be a bit of a nerd. A bit. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll sh- I like exactly. watching question period. I I got to watch, I got to go to question period at the legislature this year and I was just loving it and uh everyone else is looking at me trying to stay awake and i'm on the edge of my seat just You're like oh it. did you see that mm-hmm. um, i want i want to turn to my uh, last subject and it's a subject that i think is needs more attention across canada and that's tourism and that's yeah. tourism to sm- uh, smaller communities and i think and I, I i i firmly believe this every community every rm every municipal district every town village and uh, i uh, improvement unique urban district in manitoba iud uh has a tourism aspect that needs to be told so i want to know as someone who's going to be coming to the rm of lumsden in the spring of next year because i'm heading to regina and i'll be stopping in give me a call what should people see in the rm or even in the town if you want to encompass the town as well yeah so that i'm gonna uh, i'm not gonna talk about the town um, I think you should have someone from the town on because the town do a phenomenal job promoting themselves and they are worthy of their own segment. So I, I'm not snubbing the town. I'm just going to focus on the RM because we could easily talk about the town for an hour. They do a really good job. So the RM definitely rides the piggy, you know, piggybacks the town a little bit on that one. Um, we don't, the RM is definitely guilty of not promoting tourism in the RM. That's for sure. Um, but we still have, we have a lot. I actually, I knew this was going to come up. So, you know, I'm, I started thinking about all the things that we have out here and there's a lot, there's a reason why we had such a big population boom. Uh, the trails, the rivers, the river is just beautiful. Throw a kayak or a canoe in there. There's, you know, there's a million places you can launch from and you can spend all day out there. Um, you know, it would take you forever to do all the rivers around here and just the, the number of natural trails, the trans Canada trail goes through here and the trail is just amazing um the the town alums in has someone on staff and they coordinate that and uh it's it's just you know phenomenal um you go through the valley itself uh there's tons of market gardens um those get a lot of attention uh craven country and now it's called what do they call it now uh country thunder music festival that's you know that's kind of you know a big one that gets us a little bit of attention um i didn't know that's in the rm yeah yeah well kind of on the yeah well technically Someone might dispute it. I think it is. Claim it for yourself, man. Claim it for yourself. I think it's in the arm of Lumsden, yeah. So it might be like bordering Long Lakedon, but I think it's in the arm of Lumsden. But I'm sure we could settle down with them and over a case and have that one. So I I don't know. We're taking it. That's for sure. But it's either way, it's right there. Um, You have to come through Lumsden to get to it. So we're going to take it. Uh, Lots. um, There's a... All the other names, uh, Beaver Creek Ranch, they've done just a phenomenal job of promoting horsemanship in the area. There's so many acreages and people wanting to get into that lifestyle that maybe didn't grow up on a farm like myself that don't really know where to get started. And they've done just a phenomenal job of really promoting that industry. Um, there's places like uh, Pumpkin Hollow and there's another one. They're kind of similar um, Fennec Farms. So th- where th- those are kind of the places where they're kind of like active farms where you can go out and 
um, there, it's really more, I think, in my opinion, more um, they market towards the urban kind of things, but they'll have a corn maze or some tractor rides kind of thing. And it genuinely, the kids do love it. I've taken my kids. They love it. So uh, there's, there's so much to do out here. Uh, we have three golf courses in the RM. And then okay. there's... You, you've sold me. You've sold yeah, me, man. <laughs> there's, so just in the RM, there's three. And then there's one. Well, I think there's about 12 within an hour. Within an hour, with with forty five within forty five minutes, there's access to twelve more golf courses. So, I think I'm right on that. So, so it's just you know, there's so golfing much in our future, there, Cody. Yeah, yeah. Let me know, man. I would love to take you around. That'd be great. Um, you know, hunting, fishing, those are big for me. Um, that's big in the area. We have a lot of that, uh, a lot of space here. Um, Regina Beach is kind of you know same. They could you could probably do a co episode with Lums and Regina Beach. Uh, but tons of people access them to get to the lake. Tons of boating and fishing there. So. It's, it's, I remember when I moved here, uh, the first thing I did, you know, was buy a skidoo because, you know, everyone, if you live here, the first thing you want to do is just be part of the area. And there's just so much to do. Whatever you're into, you can find something to do. So it's just a great area. So I, I've been meaning to ask this because I'm 90%. I heard you correctly at the beginning of the interview, but I want to ask it now if that's okay. Did you say your dad was on a city or on a RM council? Yeah, he was. He did a couple terms as counselor and a couple terms as reef. Okay. Do you mind me asking a very poignant question? And and, and might I might have to edit this out because last time I asked this, I found out the person's father who was on council had passed away before they got on council. Uh, you're laughing. And I, I'm not sure if that's a good laugh or a bad laugh, but did you talk to your father before uh, putting your name forward? No, my, my dad did actually pass away in a farm accident. Ah. <laughs> He, um, about six months before I got on council, he passed away in a farm accident. So he, he didn't know, um, I get choked up about it still. So, um, no, he didn't know, but, uh, I apologize for that. No, I am the worst. For that. That. I don't honestly do not apologize. It's all good. It's, uh, there's no way you could know. So, um, it's funny. So the question, this the question I have to ask though, then is yeah. would you, yeah. would you recommend it to your kids? Oh, um, I don't know. No, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't recommend it because I know, but in the sense of I want to be more organic. If, if, if they decide they want to run, I want them to do it on, on their own merit. I don't want to be because I, I had anything to do with it. Um, it, it. I don't want that to case to be the case at all. So same as, same as my dad, you know, like, um, sorry, I got a donkey on me in the background. If you can hear that. Um, it's saying so, Chris, I mean, you're an it, ass for asking this question. <laughs> no, 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 no. Honestly, it doesn't doesn't bother me at all. I sometimes get a little upset, you know, emotional about it, but I'm not upset talking about him. That's for sure. No, I I know he'd be real proud of me for doing it. And then same with like going one step further with Sarm. I know he had been, uh, you know, hearing. I didn't know at the time, but you know, I think he he would have been interested in doing that too. And I know that would he'd be just thrilled knowing that I'm doing that and this is what I'm doing and I'm doing it for the right reasons. You know, it's not a, I never, you know, I didn't go to school hoping to get here. It just kind of, there was a need and I stepped up and how I ended up here. I think he'd be real proud of. So um, if you want to edit this out, Chris, you can leave it in. I don't care. I, I don't tell the story very often, but when I ran for, for SARM, um, it was kind of funny. They, uh, the, the staff at SARM do a really good job whenever there's a vote going on because everything's all digital with clickers and then they show the results on the screen. So while the 30 seconds that were happening, uh, while everyone was putting their vote in, the song they played was uh, Neil Diamond's Sweet Caroline. And uh, so when my dad died, um, a couple of days later, I grabbed his car. I was back on the farm. I had to run to town to get something, jumped in his car. And that was Neil Diamond was everything to that guy. And that song was queued up on the radio, but I jumped in the car and put the keys in. That's the song to play. So it was kind of a special song for me anyway. It was like, all right, that was dad's song. I'm in dad's car. It was just kind of a nice moment. And when the, uh, when they put the votes in, when everybody was voting, they played Sweet Caroline by Neil Diamond. And uh, yeah. So what time I, I knew. Eight? Sorry, what was that? What type of man was your father? Oh, he's a farmer in every good way. So um, just a good guy. Real good did you guy. See him, um, did you see him up close and personal as a municipal politician? No, no. Uh, we never talked about um, 
anything to do about municipal politics at all. In fact, we had a rule when I got home from school, I wasn't allowed to check the voicemail. So it was because, you know, somebody would phone them up mad or something. So I, I remember that. I remember when we got our first, our first, uh, our first, it was a tape recorder for doing the voicemail. And I remember we weren't allowed to check the messages because there'd always be somebody on there going on a rant or something. So, um, no, he, he, we, I, I do remember being a little kid going to the office with him once in a while and there, they had a little fridge in the corner. I could go and grab a drink and hang out in the office. And so, you know, being in the office, you know, I grew up with that, but as far as like discussing policy, that kind of stuff, no, I remember being in a float. My dad was driving the truck, um, you know, with the RM. So, you know, being around the RM, I guess now it's funny it's stuff I don't really think about, but yeah, I, being around the RM and that kind of lifestyle, kind of like being a rink rat, I'm kind of used to that. Um, but no, we never discussed policy, nothing like that. You know, we, we weren't, uh, weren't a political family in that sense. Not at all. So he, he did a pretty good job. Of, sorry. Do you instill that into your kids? Do you talk pol- politics with your family? No, my kids are little. Wells just turned two last week and Kaylee's going to be five here in June. In January, sorry. I was five when I was at my first campaign, so I know what five right. years old remember. So yeah, I got my mug from Kaylee for. I, I no, want to turn to I want to turn to my last no. question, if that's okay, uh, and it's yeah, a kind it's of a million, million dollar question. It's the one that I think every municipal leader knows how to answer, but I'd always like to put them on the spot to answer it. So, in your opinion, what makes the RM in Lumsden such a unique place to live, to work? and to raise a family. Yeah, uh, I can answer that for sure. The RM alums and the town alums and combined, because that's, I think every, every community needs a hub. It is as close to an old fashioned Saskatchewan town as you're going to find. Um, we have avoided the commercial commercialization. Um, you know, we don't have this big wave of all the brand names. You come to town, you know, we have a subway, but small town doesn't. But, um, and the rumor is we're getting a Tim Hortons, but you come whoa, to town. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I know, you're big, it's the rumor, going big time the rumor. So, you know, like that's, you know, that kind of, if you need something, you go to the coffee shop. You know, we don't have that um, brand name. Recon- you know, you, you don't drive down, you see billboards for the same thing that every other town has. Um, we're big enough where you can have a little bit of privacy, but still everybody kind of knows everybody. We have all the services you need here and uh, you know, it's just a, a great place. We have a great combination of good farmland, good cattle land and things to do to get out of the way. Like we have the Valley that is just, and it's a big Valley. There's space for everybody where you can go and kind of find your own little, little piece of land where you can kind of get away. So it's just a, a great place to live. Um, coming out of Southern Saskatchewan where they had just an absolute population tank. Um, there's quite a few people in the area from that area that saying they ended up here because they were kind of looking for what they grew up with. So this to me reminds, I would just, I mean, I wasn't there obviously, but this, if you were to look up, like say like a Crane Valley, Saskatchewan, which now has a population of about six, that was where I went to school. And at one time it was probably 500 to a thousand had three grain elevators and a Chevy dealership. Um, you know, those communities are just gone. That's where I grew up. I went to school there. My school's shut down, been closed for a long time. Um, those communities just evaporated. They're gone. And I kind of found here, I think, what it would have been like being there. So you back see, in the heyday. Do you see a resurgence in small town Saskatchewan? In a lot of them, yeah. You're seeing like a lot of the smaller towns just kind of went away, but some of the more medium sized towns have done well um there's definitely people moving out here because of the housing unaffordability um you know in the in the urban centers they're able to find some not necessarily cheaper but your dollar can go a little further out here in some cases in some cases it can't but um you know it's it's different and uh yeah no it's just it's it's a nice place it really is so it's got a bit of an old-fashioned feel to it Cody, I want to thank you so much for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule to do this interview. Um, I say this a lot, but I'm, I, I'm going to actually say it sincerely. Hopefully it comes across sincerely. Thank you. Thank you for serving your community. Thank you for sitting down and doing this interview. And thank you for making Saskatchewan and municipal politics as, as engaging as I found it over the last 45 minutes of our conversation. So thank you so much. No, no problem trying. But yeah, and that's the real offer. I think I sent you my phone number. Give me a call. We'll go golfing when you're here and we'll show you on, do another podcast from the golf course. So let's do it.
Thank you for joining us today for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date on the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support either. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering you the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of this community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues what truly matter to you and to our communities. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.